Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Third, and I am this Scottish Aspie. I'm really finding it hard, honestly. See, like having a YouTube channel that's like over 7,000 subscribers, and it's like you need to constantly be on top of it all the time. It's, really, it's a lot of work, especially because I work full time, but I still want to keep on doing videos for this channel. So I think it's important. And this week, what I want to speak about is something that's very, very, very close to my heart. This week, I want to talk about death and kind of autism spectrum disorder and um, how I have kind of dealt um, with the death um, that we've had in our family recently and kind of to see other people's perspective on it and maybe see if they've maybe went through the same kind of grieving process as me and if they've dealt with it the same way and to kind of give maybe some people a better understanding um, of how um, people on the spectrum may deal with grief. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, um, sadly we lost our border terrier, uh, Ralphie. He was only eight. So it was a hard one for us. Um, he had bone cancer, which uh, I'm pretty sure it was hereditary. Things like this can happen. It was unexpected. He had a lump out like that. He was he just wasn't well. He was really, really slow, lethargic and stuff. And unfortunately, he was in a lot of pain. And unfortunately, we thought it was like maybe an abscess. Uh, and we paid all the vet bills. Antibiotics weren't working. It was getting bigger. And it took him that morning thinking he was going to come back. And then, in back of my head though, I was still like, and this is a thing that like, I've spoke to a few people on the spectrum and they do kind of the same thing as me, where kind of death is something that we kind of prepare for. I think it's because we don't like being, like especially me, I don't like having stuff sprung on me. So I kind of like to prepare myself for things. So I've, sounds morbid as shit, like, but I've genuinely thought about nearly everybody dying. Um, I don't like, my wife's the hardest one. I don't like to think about my wife dying. I've thought about both my kids dying. I've thought about my mum dying. I've thought about my pals dying. Um, I've thought about everybody dying and their funerals and like the emotions that I would feel and stuff and how I would deal with that and how that would kind of work. Just so if, it, if someone was sprung on me, I have a kind of idea of like how I, sh sh what should I do? Like how should, like what should I do? Should I do this? Should I speak to so-and-so? Should I help them out with the funeral? And, like, how would the funeral work? Would I be, like, the one underneath the casket? Would I need to go see their mum and dad if it was a pal? If it was my mum and dad, I'd need to be there for my dad, my mum, and get it for my kid. It's, honestly, it's morbid as anything, but I, I've i got this thing where I need to be one step ahead of stuff like that. I was, like, 70% sure he was coming back. 30% of it was bone tumour that'd get it out. I didn't know it. I didn't know it spread as far as it spread. I had to deal with it there and then, and basically she gave me an ultimatum. And this is horrible, and she was like, Sorry, Mr. Third, but like, well, I've got other dogs to see. And unfortunately, I can only keep Ralphie under anaesthetic for another five minutes. So you've got five minutes um, to make a decision whether your dog lives or dies today. I mean, she was like, you can have him for a couple of days, but you've got five minutes. Like, you can only hold that anaesthetic for another five minutes. And I think that's the cruelness of the world. And I think um, if you're an Aspie, you know about the cruelness of the world. It's just we, we become accustomed um, to how cruel the world can be. And growing up in the world as it is but it was a hard thing to take because uh, there and then I had to make this I, I was like right I've got to think about the kids I've got to tell my wife I was in work fucking at, the, at that point and like she went phone is back in like I'll, if you can phone is back but like phone is back within five minutes <laughs> and I was like uh, that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks and even though I was prepared for it I just kind of started crying and I couldn't be around my dad because me and my dad worked together in the college and I just battered downstairs. He went off, gave me my time. I went into like a little store that we've got where nobody can come near us. Um, had to phone my wife. She was obviously, she couldn't believe it. And again, I, like, I was choking up and stuff and I never get choked up. And it was that moment where I was like, right, not only I've just had to tell my wife that like we've gone, and Ralph, but for anybody that has a family dog, they're not like just dogs. Like Ralphie was my son. Ralphie to me was my firstborn. We had Ralphie before we had kids. Um, Ralphie was, when Madison was born, I think Ralphie was one. Ralphie was still technically a puppy when Madison was born. And, you know, he was with Madison his entire life. He was there when Genevieve was born. He was with us with every house. He was he was the very first thing that I had. Like, I'd never looked after anything in my life. And, like, Ralphie was the very first thing I was able to, like, look after. And I think, for especially with pets, I think it hits people on the spectrum hard. Because I find that a lot of people on the spectrum have pets. Uh, it's like a comforting thing because people are very hard for us to deal with. Where like, especially dogs, dogs just have an, an, a, a love and like a, it's an un, 
denying love and loyalty and they'll do anything for you and they almost understand your feelings better than human beings. Like when my kids or my wife were, were upset, Ralphie would be there. I used to feel bad because I had a bit of a temper when I was younger. When I used to get beat on FIFA and stuff, I'd fucking throw them on. No, I wouldn't throw stuff at him, but I'd throw stuff. And as a puppy, he was like, fuck, this guy's fucking mental. <laughs> like, fuck, I should have stayed at the farm. <laughs> fucking hell. But um, it was a thing where it was like, no matter what I did, like he was by my side. And all he wanted to do was be on me. He was why, like, whenever, like, wherever I was, he was there. He used to, like, we used to give him beds. I built him his own bed and he didn't sleep in it because he always wanted to sleep at the side of my bed. He wanted to sleep on my clothes. He just wanted to be with me, around me all the time. And Ralphie had really bad separation and anxiety. It was just to make it really, really, really bad for us because we'd leave him and he'd get really upset. Um, but again, it was because he loved the family so much and we loved him. And it was that, like, undenying like love especially for an autistic man i felt like he understood me and i could be myself around him i just found myself always spending time with him more than anybody else like i used like i remember like i trained him when he was a pup i got dead into it i became focused on it fucking me being me i created like a border terrier blog and stuff and it was very particular about what i fed him and stuff and then, um, like, as he got older and stuff, we'd go on walks. We'd, me and him would be <laughs> stuck in the room because I didn't want to speak to anybody. It was like, I was too antisocial when people were in my house. He was too social. <laughs> I wanted to see everybody. So we'd be cooped up in the bedroom and it'd just be me and him. So we spent a lot of time together. And, like, I felt like, it, I don't know, just whenever I was on my own, he was always there. And it was kind of the companion that I kind of missed because I was a, quite a lonely child. So for me, it was really, really hard because... He was my routine, you know what I mean? It was like I fed him every day. I came in the house, he was there. Um, I had to shout at him fucking every day. <laughs> He'd bark at every time the fucking door went. Um, and it was just, he was just my routine. It was just, I was comfortable. Um, every time I was in the living room watching TV, he was sat there in his wee bed in the living room looking at us, wanting some, <laughs> wanting scraps or whatever. I was just used to me doing like these videos, my Pro Tool stuff and my YouTube stuff. And he'd be sitting right on that bed, just there. Just lying there, watching me do my stuff or half asleep half the time. But he was a massive part of my life and a massive part of my routine. So, you know, like having to make that decision absolutely crippled me. I had to then do this weird thing where I think people on the spectrum might find it difficult is that you've got these emotions, but you don't know how to deal with them. Emotions are very hard, I know, for people on the spectrum, especially for me. So the emotional side of it was very hard because I don't like showing emotion. I'd say I've personally shown emotion like twice. <laughs> like I cried at my granddad's funeral for a wee bit and that was me done. And then I cried during my wedding speech, which I've got a video of, you can check that out. I, can st I can't watch it back because I don't like to watch it getting upset. But, like two times in my life that I've been like openly upset. Being honest, I've probably cried like fucking five times in my adult life. Everything's very, very suppressed with me. I don't like the feeling of being emotional. I hate it. I despise it. It's like a weakness to me and I just don't know how to deal with it. I feel very vulnerable when I'm in that state. Now, the hard thing for me was that, like, uh, even though I was grieving and I was, like, so upset, I had to, like, go, right, when I go home, I've got a role. And I think in my head it kind of helped because I'm so literal with my autism is that it's kind of like I'm the man of the house. I'm, like, the one that, like, holds it all together. For my wife, it must have been really difficult because she, to her, it was just like, let's let's grieve as a family. Where I was like, I cannot let you guys see me in this way. I can't be this vulnerable around you. And it must have been probably hard because I know Madison kind of spoke about, uh, my daughter spoke about like how like daddy, like, 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 does daddy really kind of, in a sense, she was kind of like, does daddy really miss Ralphie? Or is daddy sad that like Ralphie died? Because she didn't, I didn't really allow her to see it. It was very practical. And I was like, no, like, Ralphie's died and he's not coming back, honey. Okay, I was trying to, like, just basically be very blunt with her. Do the same with Genevieve. She's younger. She didn't understand. And kind of like that night, I had to do a Facebook post because the way I work is I need, when I have emotions or whenever I have anything up here, I have to get it out. Because once it's out, it's out. And for some reason, putting it out on blogs or social media kind of helps me because it's in word format. See, when someone's, like, in word format or whatever, it works for me. And I made a big post, a massive post, talking about my feelings, about how I was feeling. And it kind of just really brought back. And I just, again, started sobbing really hard, really hard. 
And then once I was done, I went upstairs. And ever since that, I've never, I've not cried again. And I've been very, very cold, and very, very, very literal about it. It took time for me to speak about it. I didn't go and see like my mum and dad and stuff for the first wee while because I knew my mum would hug us and I was like, I can't deal with that. I can't deal with that. I don't want to get upset in front of people. And I think my need to not be upset in front of people and understanding that I still had to be part of society, I still had to go to work, I still had to see other people, people were going to come to me and be like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about Ralphie. I think what I did was I just completely blocked every emotion and it's it's hidden somewhere. It's in so it's, it's up here somewhere. It is somewhere and they're lodged in the back of my mind. That emotion's there and it's probably still very raw, but to a lot of people it probably looks like I'm over it. Like I just wanted every reminder of him away because it helped me kind of grieve better. And I think my wife probably took it really, really hard because she was like, No, I want to keep everything out. It's like like how fucking like a little bit like how fucking dare you? It's like he was a part of this fucking family, and it's like you're just like carrying on like he never fucking existed. I found it that like if I compartmentalized it in a way where it was like it's very past tense. Ralphie, yes, yes, he was a dog. Yes, yes, he was my dog. Yes, he is dead. <laughs> He's dead now. Um, yes, he had cancer. Unfortunately, um, that yes, that is it, and that's it done now. And I just went on with my life, and I was like, I'm going to make any more YouTube videos. And I think I was surprised how I just went, you need to get yourself in a routine. I could feel it. And my wife was worried. It's like, this is going to hit you. You're going to have like a bad spell where it's just the grief comes late. And I know now it's not, it's not, I just feel it. I just feel it in my bones that like, it's, it's, it's almost suppressed. Um, and it's probably is quite dangerous because we, I'm not dealing with the, the full emotions of it. I've really dealt with it for a day. But, um, you know what I mean, I had to pick up his urn and stuff like that because we got him cremated and stuff and I picked up his urn. And to me, that was a, a level of um, comfortability. Honestly, I think getting the urn was, I felt like he was home because it was, we got his lead back and stuff and that was quite difficult. But I felt that I wasn't getting as emotional because I felt that my emotions were pushed further back, way further back. I've been trying to push myself and, you know, I was starting to speak to people more about it. And the more literal I was about it, it was like, yeah, he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. Yes, he's dead. It was really sad that happened. Then I speak about other stuff. I speak about the vet bill and like how well I had insurance kind of taking the, kind of taking the piss in the vet, taking the piss a little bit but the money side of things and took ages to like to consent it to the insurers and blah, blah, blah. And like, if I, if for me, the grief is easier to deal with if I kind of distract myself with all the other parts of it and the emotional side of it. I don't speak about it, I don't think about it. Ralphie had relationship, different relationships with everybody in the family. He was him and Madison were super tight. Because of like Ralphie used to s lie outside Madison's room and she was a baby. Um because he, he just wanted to be around her all the time. And he honestly, she'd be a little baby. Like this be pup border terrier pup. Um and she'd be asleep and he'd be right there. And he'd just lie on her. But he was so gentle and we never ever worried about Ralphie. Ever, ever. We're never worried about Ralphie. Well Madison once. Um, Genevieve was a little bit um, younger, so it was a little bit harder. But um, Madsen and Ralphie had a really unique bond. Laura, very, it was, that was my wife's baby. That was her first as well, and that was like that's my baby. That's my, like that's my that's my fur baby. I, I don't know. It was just it was a very very unique relationship to me that I've not I've never had that relationship with kind of any other being. I mean, like me and my wife's relationship is very like that's very unique. I would be an absolute. I, I can't even contemplate it. it's that hard to think about my wife dying that I can't even actually find it difficult to think about it I can't even do more autistic thing where I like think about like everything in detail so I just thought I'd kind of share like me being on the spectrum and kind of dealing with the way I've dealt with grief in the way that like I am at a place now where I don't even think I could go there I don't know I think I've genuinely I've suppressed it that much that the grief is has gone into the point where I've kind of removed nearly everything to the fact that like I don't I won't even look at certain things in case it reminds me because I didn't like the reminders I didn't like um, looking at his bowl and being like fucking I like, had the food I was like get the food out um, there were certain parts of the garden I refused to look at because I'd be like oh that, that that's his perch and then, there were certain times where again I'd look at the side of the bed and he's always I'm like I'd expect I'd, I would get out of bed expect him if I could stand on him because he used to fucking always be at the side of my bed and like fuck off Ralphie he used to sit right at the side of my bed um, when I was sleeping 
adrenal stand on them. And you know, it was like those reminders that it was like I felt it. And it, like the more I felt it, the more I can feel the, the suppression of the emotions coming in. Now, I, I think it is quite interesting. And um, I think it's for other people or again, somebody has a partner that's maybe on the spectrum or you think they're on the spectrum and you are dealing with grief together and you're like, I want to grieve as a team that someone my wife struggled with. It's, I don't feel we're grieving together. You've got to realise that this might be something that emotions are hard for them and they, they'll grieve in their own way um, and they, 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 they'll feel the grief the same way as you but if they do suppress it or if they distract themselves and kind of carry on with life that like nothing kind of happened and very literal about it and that life has to move on that's just their way of coping. So if you're on the spectrum and you've dealt um, with grief and stuff like that, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts and your input as well. Just again, maybe someone might help me. You might be like, no, I've been through that stage and no, what I've, I dealt with it the exact same way and know what a moment came where it hurt me like a ton of bricks and like I maybe had a, I went through a bit of a bad period or well. So it's a very, I know it's fucking somber shit. I know it is. It's really, really somber, really sad. But I think it's still important that I speak about stuff like this to kind of get this stuff out there and to help other people um, that are kind of going through the same stuff. All right. So my name's Paul Third, Discourse Aspie. Like, hopefully. Subscribe, hopefully. And I'll see you when I see you. Okay.